Welcome to Art Starts Explores, our province of play. Are you ready to get creative with us this week? Let's review our three basic rules that guide us through our exploration and play. Rule one is respect. We want to respect ourselves, anyone we're making with, our tools and making space, and the lands and waterways where we're making. How can you practice respect when you explore, play, and make? Rule two is no expectations. If we're not expecting something to turn out good or bad, we're open to it going in a whole bunch of different ways. And that means that all respectful, creative explorations are great, regardless of what it ends up looking like. Try to do things you've never tried before and ask yourself, what will happen if I... Rule number three is nothing is for keeps. Everything we make together is a test, or a draft, or creative playtime. We're just trying things out. What can you make or try today and then take apart or recycle? What can we learn by making and not keeping? These are our three rules for when we explore together every week. Okay, what will we explore together this week? Welcome to Art Starts Explores. My name is Kay Slater, and I am the Preparator and Program Facilitator at Art Starts in Schools. This month, we're continuing to explore grids. And this week, I thought what we could do is we could explore making games with grids. If you're going to participate and follow along with me making your own games, do you have any paper? I pulled paper out of my recycling bin. I used this in a, a previous week when we were exploring grids and it was still in my recycling bin. So I pulled it back out again. Then I've got some paper from a binder and a bunch of ripped paper from other places. It doesn't have to be clean. Nothing that we're making today is for keeps, so pulling something out of the recycling bin is great. Do you have any mark making tools? A mark making tool is anything that makes a mark. That's a pencil, markers, crayons, pudding. Anything that you have permission to mark up the page is, or anything you have permission to use to mark up a page is great. That's a mark making tool. I have a dotted line on my sticky here, and then I put two more things. This means that these are optional. You don't have to have them. You can make something up yourself. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to explore without having these ready to go. The first thing is, do you have a grid? Did you explore with me in a previous week? And did you make your own grid? Do you happen to have a game board? that's made out of a grid? Do you have a chessboard or a checkers board? Do you already have a grid that you can use for making today? Pull it out. The second thing that I have under the dotted line is ready-mades. And by that, I mean some toys or some game objects or some dice, things that are already made that we can look at and practice using as game pieces as we explore making games with grids. 
But if you don't have those things ready to go right now, that's okay. Later on while we're making, you might come up with an idea and you can go grab those ready-mades when you're ready. Okay, I'm gonna move some of these stickies aside so I have a bit more room to make. Some of the grids that I found in uh, my studio were some game boards. This is the game board for Scrabble, a game where you put down different letters to form words. Um, but you can see the white lines here, as I'm tracing my fingers, make an interconnected grid. Uh, in the top corner and uh, at the basically the fold lines or middle lines of the grid, the inside of the grid square has the word triple word score. Then two more over, it says double letter score. And then the row down and one over, it says double word score. So this grid already has writing and um, directions on it, but I don't, I don't have to use these words. I could ignore these words and just use the grid. I'm gonna leave that there. I also found my chessboard. Now I know this is pretty pretty shiny with the light that I have over over uh, overhead, but this is quite a big uh, chessboard, and I have these really beautiful big chess pieces that go on top of it. This doesn't have any kind of word or direction on it, so this would be a grid that I could use um, to form the base of my game. But look at a chessboard, and you know what? This because this one is kind of shiny. I made my own version of a chess or checkerboard that would be a little bit easier to see for us to explore together. And I did this by coloring in every second block in my grid with a color black. And then on the next uh, line, I alternated or chose every other square that wasn't uh, colored in so that I could have this checkerboard um, or chessboard grid. But when we look at a chessboard or a checkerboard, remember how I said there were no words or directions? What do you notice? What do you notice about uh, this grid, which is the checkerboard? And say, if you can see my screen, the grid that I made a couple weeks ago in pencil, where I don't have colored in squares, what do you notice? If I ignore some of the marks up here where I didn't finish my grid and I just look at the grid down here to compare it, the first obvious thing that I notice is that some of the squares are not colored in. Now, just like with the Scrabble board or boards that have words on it, I can ignore the fact that these squares are colored in or I could use them in my game. So in games that you already know that use a grid, why are some of the blocks colored in and why are some of them not? In chess, we use this to easier, uh, to make it easier to tell what square it is. It's easier for me to be able to count four squares over because I can go, oh, two non-colored squares and two colored squares. Versus here, it might be a little bit harder in a grid that doesn't have any kind of marks on it to be able to figure out exactly where, uh, where I'm talking about or what I'm, or where I need to go. So it's kind of a wayfaring. It's kind of a way to figure out your path faster and easier. It's easier to look at than a non-colored page. In, um, in say checkers, when you have your pieces in a certain place, it also lets you know that if your piece is on a white, you can only move to other white squares. And if you're on black squares, you can only move on other black squares. So depending on the game and the rules you make, you can use your surface or your background or your game board to uh, form rules based on the kind of grid that you have or you made. So when you're using a ready-made, there might be certain things that you either have to ignore, uh, cover up, or you can use in your play, or you can make your own grid and you can start basically from zero 
and go, oh no, okay, I don't want to go every, um, every second square. I want to color in every third square. And so there's two lines in between. And then uh, over here, every two squares, and then every two squares, and every two squares, and every two squares. So maybe my game board starts to look like this instead. And I could make a couple of different grids. You could also uh, get some gridded paper or print a grid uh, from the internet so that you could try um, different places on your grid that you want to color in or mark up, or maybe you just don't want to mark it up at all. So there you go. So how the grid is laid out actually affects how your game pieces might move when you're thinking about making a game. Well, I'm going to put this grid to the side and I'm going to put my chessboard back in the middle again. And for this one, now what I'm going to do is go, okay, well, I know a couple of games. I've said chess and I've said checkers that use this checkerboard, this uh, grid with colored in squares to make games. But I'm going to come up with a whole new game using my chess or checkerboard here. So I'm not going to pull out chess pieces. I'm not going to pull out checker pieces. I'm going to use my own pieces. So remember before I said, do you have any ready-made? So I've got this little toy uh, here. And I'm going to put my toy on the board. I'm going to put it basically in the middle, right there. So once you put a piece, or once you put a um, an object, what happens to your grid? What changes? What changes for me, depending on where I put the ready-made, is how far away from the edge or boundary of my grid matters. So I couldn't put this piece right in the direct center because the number of pieces that I have here are even. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So because it's even, I can't actually put it right in the middle unless my character is straddling or is on top of two of the boxes. Same with here in this direction, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So because it's equal here, same thing. If I wanted to put it in the exact middle, it would have to be straddling two lines. Oh, and I didn't even do it right. So it's over here, straddling two lines. But if I wanted to put it in the exact middle, in the exact middle of the grid, I would actually have to straddle both the lines this way and this way to the center point. Okay, so now my piece is in the exact center of the grid. What do you notice? Well, now what I notice is that um, this piece is on four of the squares. But remember how I was telling you before we could kind of ignore um, certain things about our grid when we're using ready-mades. We can make up the decisions that we want. Well, what, what reason is there that I couldn't just choose that each movement of the piece that I put down when I'm making my game is that a character has to move uh, at the midpoint of four squares. So they have to actually sit on the uh, the cross section or the exact middle of four squares. So that's how the character actually moves. Rather than moving uh, forward or backwards or side to side on each square, I'm going to be moving every four squares. Okay, so that's one way I could do it. But if we look at this board, when we start thinking about movement. Remember before I was telling you um, that there are certain things that we can read when there are boards that already have things on it. So versus the grid where there's really just the outlines, um, once we have things on the board, there are certain things that we assume or certain things that we, um, we follow because of 
how we've used the checkerboard in the past. So if I was going to put this uh, toy maybe over here at the very edge of my board, what do we notice now? Well, I have an assumption. I am assuming, I am guessing, I am thinking that it is true that this piece probably can't move backwards, that there is an edge to my game board, that my world, that my game is contained within the grid. And so this mo the movement of this character is limited by my board. And what other ways do we assume there's a limitation? Or that we we can guess how this character or this um, this ready-made or this piece is going to move. Well, we kind of start thinking that maybe each one of these squares is connected to a movement. So moving forward one. Is that the only way that we could move forward by one? We can also move to the side. we could also move forward. We have nothing that tells us how many squares we can move, how fast, uh, how slow, or how many numbers of squares we can move. But by putting a piece, by putting something onto the board, we start seeing each of these squares as potential movement or a footstep. So I've pulled out a little plastic circular disc that I had. It kind of looks like a game piece. And so it's a little bit smaller than my big toy that I've put on here. And it fits the square pretty, pretty well, right? There's, there's uh, space all around the outside of my circle. And it has a certain look compared to how big this piece is. Let's look at these two pieces. What else can we kind of feel or notice? when we're looking at these two pieces. This piece doesn't feel very mm, aggressive or big or um, in your face, strong. Kind of feels like it's less strong than this piece. This piece is so big and that it actually takes up, uh, even though the footstep, the footprint of it fits within the square, the cape of this character comes off to the side. They have energy that this piece doesn't necessarily have. So when you're choosing your ready-made size could also say something about um, the game pieces, especially if you have multiple game pieces. What if I was going to take a couple more of these circles? And I've got a couple of different colors now. I've got some silver, I've got some gold got some blue, I've got some red. And I'm going to put these on various pieces or uh, various squares around this character, just kind of spreading it out. And here, I'll put a few over here. What do we notice now about the board? Now that I have maybe a dozen, maybe 12 of these little circle squares in, uh, sorry, little circle pieces on the various squares, but I still have my big toy figure here. even though I have a greater number or more of these circle pieces, I still feel like this is the most powerful or strong or maybe um, most capable. So the one that can do the most compared to all of these. And so the number of pieces compared to size of pieces might also change. What if I took away this really big piece? And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take away all of the uh, red pieces uh, and this yellow piece uh, and this green piece. There we go. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take out, I'm gonna specifically pull out a few more pieces of the gold. So now I have probably an equal number of gold to silver pieces on the board. And then I have two blue and one red. 
What do we notice now? It kind of feels like the red dot is the most important now because there's only one of it. I don't know how far along my game has gone or if this is even a game in, in uh, progress, if, if the game has already started. But I do know that if I'm just looking at the pieces and even if I was to line them all up beside each other, that that red dot by itself looks like it's important because it's all by itself, because it's unique. And so just like when I had the really big toy on the page, all of a sudden that red dot, it's still kind of important because it's by itself, but this piece still feels bigger and more powerful because it's just so big and it takes up so much space. What else do you notice now that I pulled back the big piece? What I noticed was it's the same color blue as these pieces here. And so all of a sudden before, when I didn't have the blue piece here, there, sorry, the blue uh, circles here, this still feels very strong, very powerful, more powerful than any of these other pieces. And maybe this red dot is the second most important. But when I put the blue back and it's the same color as my big piece, what does it feel like? It kind of feels like they're on the same team kind of gives more power to this piece here. So choosing color, choosing the number, choosing the size of the pieces that you're going to use, feels like all of those things uh, have an effect. They have a meaning that happens when you put them on the, the board. So beyond just the decision of whether or not to color certain pieces or not, the color of pieces, the size of pieces, how easy it is to pick up, all of those things are connected to how you're going to move through the game. There's one other um, way of movement. Actually, there are two other ways. So we talked about going forward uh, and backwards and side to side. But what about when we only stick on the same color, just like in checkers? So we can only move on the diagonal. So if I had this piece here, and I'm gonna move some of my pieces over, and you know what, just to make it, because we were talking about color, I'm only gonna pick, actually I'm gonna pick blue because I already talked about blue being the same as this big character here. There we go. I'm gonna put gold on this side. You might not have pieces that are the same, but you could draw them. You could rip them out of some paper because right now we're just playing. We're just uh, prototyping. We're just trying things out. And so we don't have to have perfect and finished pieces while we're just playing and trying to make different games. You could challenge yourself to say how many different kinds of games you could make with the same pieces, not bringing anything in when you're all finished. These kind of look like coins. Maybe if I had some uh, pennies or some five cent or 10 cent coins, um, I could use coins. What else could you use? Okay, so now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of, of the silver circles on one side. And then I have seven of the same circles in blue, but then I also have my really big toy. And I've only put them on the white pieces. What could the black pieces represent? They could all be holes. So we can't actually step on these pieces. They could be lava. They could be water. So we could set the rules to say what these pieces are, which would limit us or keep us from moving on to those pieces. You get to decide how does the environment change when you assign or you choose or you tell one of the squares that this is what they are. So now I can't move on to the black pieces. Okay. Same thing as if we changed it to only being on the black pieces or black squares. Here, I'm gonna move it over. 
little bit harder to see because of the contrast, but that's fine. Okay, so now what if the white pieces are sky and you fall upwards or you fall down because we're up on an island? Or what if these are snow and you're trying to skip on stones to get all the way across? Or what if you drew pictures in each of the, um, the white pieces because it's a little bit easier to see? Maybe there are special um, squares that you want to have that maybe all of these pieces, and here I'm going to rip up, because remember we were just trying things out. So I'm going to rip up right here. So this area right here that's surrounded by flowers. So maybe as my game progresses, if um, a token or a, a piece moves in the middle of these flowers, you get a drink of water and maybe that's a point or maybe you get to take some flowers and now you have something that maybe your your uh, token changes color and now now you have flowers and until such time as you give somebody some flowers you stay green and i meet another character i give them flowers they become they become green and i go back to silver i don't know it's up to you you get to make the rules as you're going along When we restrict our movement this way to diagonals, you also get to decide um, whether or not they get to move front or back, right? So I'm saying that, yeah, you can only move on uh, black squares, but once you move forward, so if I was sit sitting here, there you go, and I'm sitting over here in real life, so maybe all my pieces can only move in this direction. I can never move backwards. That's a rule you could make as well. What happens when your pieces get over to the other side? Do they win? Are they stuck? You get to ask, what happens when I? All right, I'm gonna move my flowers off the board. There we go. What if we just use those squares to tell us how to set up the board? And then otherwise, once the board is set up, you can actually move in any direction that you want as long as it's contained within a square. What kind of movement would people make? So before I've even decided the goal of my game, how somebody wins or loses or works together with another person, how the game ends, any of those things, I'm just looking at possible pieces and possible game boards, the way we can use our grid um, and on all of these things that people already assume without having to start from zero. So if you wanted to make a game with a game board, I'm going to use a piece of paper where it doesn't necessarily bleed through. So you can totally make your game board, you know, like this, and people have to move along there. But when we add lines to it, something happens, right? People automatically assume that they have to move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They have to move in this along this path and they move on each square, just like here, right? So we get to already assume that somebody is going to know that when they sit down and then we tell them rules. It's a familiar place it's more familiar than say if you gave them a snake board and they'd have to look at it and go okay yep so there's a start over here maybe it says start or maybe there's an arrow or maybe there's some kind of mark that says put your pieces here there's something that tells you that this is where you're going to start but here it's kind of uh you know that the 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 steps are going to be um connected to each one of the squares but where do you start? Does the board move like this? Does the board sit in a diamond shape and you have to sit at the corners? Is it a four person game? There's a whole bunch of things that we can do with grids, but still have people understand that each of these squares is connected to some kind of movement. And that can be really helpful 
Um, here's another example. If you were just to take a white piece of paper and say, okay, we're gonna play a game, people might not know where they need to put their pieces. They may not know where they need to move. There's, there needs to be some kind of indication on the page of where they are supposed to put their pieces or where the pieces are going to connect. And a grid really quickly and easily sets that up. There's some kind of order. There's some kind of um, easy thing to recognize when you're uh, building your game like this. Okay, one more thing that I wanted to talk about with grids and games and whatever game you're going to create is this idea of obstacles. So things we can't get around. And so with a grid, we talked about it a little bit with uh, assigning value or assigning meaning or giving meaning to each one of a specific color square. So in a grid that's already colored like this, we could go all black squares are this, or all white squares are this. But if you had your own grid. Here, I'm gonna take out the one that I drew before. So I've already drawn in some black pieces um, every two, uh, ev skipping every two pieces. But what happens if I was to bring in some other colors? And I didn't necessarily follow a pattern. I decided to go this, this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece. And now in my rules, I've decided that the blue is water. And unless you have found a boat, you can't cross these, these squares. Okay, so let's say this is the boat token that's over here. And you decide that people are going to start here. I've got a red token and I've got a red token. So I've got a green token and a red token. And then my yellow token is the boat. And so they're pretty spread out. So right now the green token is kind of hidden behind the water. And so I'm gonna have to go around the water to get over to the boat, whereas the red piece is going to have a, a bit of an advantage because they can just go right over to the boat. So maybe that's maybe that's one way that you can talk about obstacles. Another way that you can uh, explore obstacles and grids is uh, through penalties. So like if somebody if you were uh, telling people if they ever end up on certain squares, they lose that piece. So just like with chess, if uh, two pieces encounter each other and one piece is stronger or can move on to that square, it eliminates, it gets rid of a piece. So maybe in your grid, you decide that some of these obstacles are ways that somebody actually loses a piece and it's whoever has the most pieces left on the grid when they're all finished. There's one other piece. Um, I said that there were two other things. There's one other thing that I haven't introduced, and that's some kind of chance device. And so with most port, uh, board games, there's usually a die of some kinds. Maybe there's dice, there's multiple die. What changes on your grid when you bring a chance device like a, um, a die to your grid? Well, all of a sudden, this piece changes the, the uh, possible or potential movement across the grid. Now we're not necessarily going one, two, three, four, five, or just one movement each time. The dice gets to decide what the movement is going to be. And so I roll it, I get a two, and I can go one, two. And maybe you've dictated that um, pieces can only move on the diagonal, and maybe you've said they can move back and forth. But now I'm limited not by just the edge of my grid, I'm also limited by the chance device that you put in here. So do you want to have dice or not? What if you were to move dice around your grid as your game piece? What could you do then? 
maybe this piece can only move six because there's a six showing up on the top. And maybe this one can only move one. Or maybe there are three people at the table and player one, two, three. So it determines the order that you play. Or maybe you just decided that the dice are the pieces that you want to use. And it doesn't really matter. They're no longer dice. They're game pieces. They're ready-mades that you get to use. These are just a few ways to explore game making with grids. What did you explore today? Did you try anything new? Did you make your own grid? Did you bring in some ready-mades that are unexpected or are surprising? Just like I do every week, I'm gonna leave my camera running as I clean up because we wanna practice respect by getting our space ready to make again uh, for the future. But as I get rid of things and nothing is for keeps, I want to think about what I'm going to keep in my brain from what I explored today. What I learned and what I'm going to keep is the knowledge that I really like checkerboard grids. I really like the potential of what can happen when you only have two kinds of squares. Sure, I could bring in some different colors um, and uh, maybe add some things to the different markers, but I kind of like just the simplicity of the grid. And then all of a sudden, I really have some options to get to play with size and shape of the different objects that I put on top of the board. So I think I would like to just keep the checkerboard by itself because it really is such a powerful and um, wide use background without me really having to do anything. It really has a lot of possibility, um, which is really nice in a ready-made. Okay, so I'm gonna start cleaning up now and I look forward to making with you another week. Bye for now.